Hi guys, my name is Arielle, and this is an essay on the themes in the film Brokeback Mountain. We open on a darkened landscape, a truck traveling down a road. It's a machine carving through nature. And it's right that our main character, Ennis Del Mar, the tragic hero of this tragedy, appears from this. It doesn't take long for his counterpart, Jack Twist, to arrive in a truck as well. But his truck backfires. Jack has trouble with machines. Rightfully so. But he doesn't have trouble with eye contact. He knows who he is. He knows himself. He isn't afraid to look, either. Isn't unsure of introducing himself. He's pretty sure-footed in his gentle approach. Ennis, on the other hand, avoids any engagement. He leans against the man-made structure for physical support and uses his hat to shield his own gaze and hide the lack of confidence in his eyes. We see Ennis is skittish. He jumps when Gary's car barrels into the lot straight for him. This is the first threat of destruction and death, and it'll be a constant theme for Ennis. He is always on the lookout for this, always sure the world is coming to get him. Once the mission has been assigned by the gatekeeper, we can see more differences between these two characters. One is clearly a leader, and one is just a follower. The scene with the skittish horse represents Jack's ease with being dominant. He's obviously a gentle, friendly guy based on his openness at Gary's office and the bar scene. And true dominance means you are self-assured in your own power and your ability and authority. Ennis cannot help but be attracted to Jack's dominance. It should be noted that Ennis states plainly on the mountaintop, I'm not queer. To me, this means I am not a homosexual. Jack replies, me neither. To me, this means I'm not broken. I'm not wrong, adroit, or queer in that sense of the word. I'm not implying the characters actually mean this, but rather this is how it can translate thematically. Ennis is refusing himself. Jack accepts himself. They are both enjoying each other's company in this open landscape. There is an easy-going, simple life that they're getting a taste of away from civilization. One might say they're both searching for fun, companionship, and openness. Yeah, that's more word than he's spoken in the past two weeks. I know that's the most I've spoken. Yeah. Nature and landscape play an important role in this film. The two peaks representing the two characters and their relationship to nature. The open landscape represents the openness and freedom they find in their relationship. And there's beauty here in the simple life. There's no doors or windows like we'll find in town. It's a type of Eden or utopia, a heaven on earth. There's also religious imagery here with the sheep that they are herding. When the world ends, it feels like you may march off to hell. Speak for yourself. You may be a sinner, but I ain't yet had the opportunity. And just like that, it's all over. Their time on the big rock candy mountain has come to an end, and they're expelled from paradise. We see Ennis is acting out in aggression as a symptom of fear and insecurity. Love is not always warm and fuzzy. And there's part of him that blames Jack for the way he's feeling. We see the despair in both the characters, but it's most pronounced in Ennis, who's been hiding his feelings the whole time. This free and open landscape of paradise is juxtaposed against the framed man-made structures of town and society and civilization. Here we see houses, machines, doorways and windows, in which we view the action of the characters. At one point, Alma even tries to convince Ennis to move closer to town. While she has her reasons as a character, it also shows how Ennis is leaning more on society to fulfill him as a person. For much of the story, when we see Ennis, we watch him through these frames of doorways and windows. These are the man-made borders. Unfortunately, both characters picked women who were too much like them. Alma is submissive and a follower. 
Jack's wife is dominant and a leader. However, once he moves to town and is fully embedded in the structure of society, we can see he's still anxious and aggressive. At least this time he's channeling that aggression to fight the right targets, as he takes on the minor bosses in the hero's journey, without a problem. But it's when he tries to take out his aggression on Jack that we see it's no use. Jack is not intimidated, and he's not going to back down, because he understands that Ennis is hurting inside and doesn't know how to deal with his emotions. He's using aggression as a crutch. Even when Ennis pushes Jack away again, like he did so many years ago, Jack only grabs back harder. And that's when Ennis's tears come. Isolation and despair is another theme we see in many of the characters throughout the film. And I think one of the unique things that the director does is to show the characters to the side of the frame so we can see this kind of big empty space near them. The reason there's so much isolation and despair is because there's rejection, mostly from Ennis to other characters in the story. Jack is always the one in pursuit. Two guys living together, no way. Ennis is always making excuses as to why he can't be with Jack. Even when his marriage falls apart, it's pretty clear that there's nothing holding him back except himself. I can't be with you. Boom! Right now. <laughs> we'll see that most of Ennis's basis for rejection is built on the paranoia about the lifestyle, about what would happen if he were to be caught expressing his true feelings. You ever get the feeling? I don't know. Someone looks at you, suspicious, like he knows. Then you go out on the pavement and everyone's looking at you like they all know too. Of course, we wouldn't be watching a real hero's journey unless we got to see the hero's wound. These are the scars from his past and the wound he must heal in order to grow as a hero and to overcome the obstacles in the story, specifically the obstacles within himself and his own personality that prevent him from achieving his goal. You know, for all I know, he done the job. To Ennis, letting his guard down means getting caught. And we see this to be true. Each time he lets his guard down, he's spotted, and their relationship is seen by witnesses. This, he believes, will lead directly to death and destruction. It is this fear and paranoia that our main character must address, must rise above and defeat, if he is to maintain his hero status and accomplish his mission on this journey. One of Ennis's big mistakes is that he often chooses work over the relationships in his life. He chooses work even when it inconveniences Alma. He chooses work instead of prioritizing his relationship with Jack. He even chooses work when it comes to the relationship with his daughter. His choosing of work shows just how deep he is tied to the structure of human civilization. He may claim it's a sense of duty, but really it's just an excuse. After many years of excuses, Jack faces the final rejection. And it's Ennis choosing work over them yet again. Jack, I gotta work. I'll tell you this, I can't quit this one. I can't get the time off. You're too much for You got a better idea? I did once. This leads to the final confrontation between Ennis, who represents the world of society, technology, and machines, against the nature of Jack, who is represented by the mountain and landscape, freedom and openness. Hello? 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 
Is he buried down there? No, oh, Jack. It might be some pretend place where a bluebird sang and there's a whiskey spray. As we come to the end of the story, Ennis must face the final boss, who takes on the form of Jack's father. It's pretty apparent in the dialogue Jack's father knows all about his son and his activities. The question we have as an audience is whether Ennis is prepared for this big battle. Unlike most other scenes in the film, he's no longer skittish, and he's not fidgeting. He's calm and collected. He sits very still and doesn't really break eye contact. There's nowhere left to run and hide. And now, due to Jack's death, he really has nothing left to lose. And it's upstairs in Jack's childhood bedroom that he finds the truth of their relationship and the true cost of his mistake. Jack really did love him from the very beginning, and this is represented symbolically by the shirts they wore on Brokeback Mountain, which have now been intertwined and stained with Ennis's blood. Ennis pulls the shirt close. He has a deep well of pain and suffering that has always existed in him, but now he can express it, and not just through the lens of aggression or denial. He's in pain, and he's finally allowing himself to actually feel it. This is the best thing he can do at this point to honor his relationship with Jack. At the end of the film, we've come full circle. We see a car driving in a dark landscape. It's Ennis's daughter traveling to meet him. In the beginning, it was Ennis traveling towards civilization. Now, people must venture out into the landscape to find him. I love the way this film shows the passage of time in this 20-year-odd story by showing the children getting older in various scenes throughout the film. First, we see them as infants. Then we see them as children swinging and they grow up to be teenagers. Until the final scene where we see the child is no longer a child. She's growing into a young woman. She's got her own car, her own love life, and is preparing for marriage herself. At first, he retreats into his impulsive old ways. The invitation to his daughter's wedding surely unnerves him. Alma will be there, Alma who knows his big secret and he'll be required to participate in a large social event where there are expectations. But our hero has truly learned a lesson. He has changed. He retracts his initial refusal that he has to work and instead prioritizes his loved one, his daughter. The change may seem minor, but it was the most important thing for him to learn. Nothing in the film is done by accident. Even this scene, where she leaves her sweater. Ennis is folding it carefully with reverence. It's an echo of the scene we saw before. It's a reminder of what he did with Jack's shirt. Jack, I swear. It's a perfect ending line to this story. What does he swear? A swear is a promise. And he promises he'll never make that mistake again. <laughs>